And uh, our first talk is going to be presented by Alpna Agarwal, M11. She's at uh, NYU School of Medicine. And she's going to talk about the phenotype associated amino acid charge differences within the HIV GP120 core. I guess I've already been introduced, so we can go ahead with the talk. Um, so just some background, HIV infects human immune cells, and specifically macrophages or helper T cells. So there are some key cell surface structures um, that are involved in the HIV in infectivity mechanism. So first, on the host cell surface, you have CD4 plus receptor, which is a glycoprotein. This is the host cell membrane. And you have chemokine co-receptors. And those are seven transmembrane domain G protein coupled receptors, as you can see here. And on the macrophage surface, you have a type CCR5 chemokine co-receptor. And on the T cell surface, you have a CXCR4 chemokine co-receptor. So there's two surface glycoproteins on the HIV surface that are important to HIV infectivity. These are GP120, which is an external subunit that mediates viral attachment to immune cells, and GP41, which is a transmembrane subunit that mediates fusion. So you can see here, they form a complex um, both in a trimer on the HIV surface. So the mechanism of HIV infectivity. HIV entry relies on the interaction of GP120 with both these um, host cell receptors. This is a two-stage interaction. First, GP120 binds CD4, this is right here, and then um, this binding with CD4 causes a conformational change in the structure of GP120, revealing the surface to bind the chemokine co-receptor, so then it binds this. So HIV st strains may be classified in many ways, but one way is based on the co-receptor usage. So HIV strains that utilize the C XCR4 chemokine co-receptor, so basically those that infect T cells can be called exvortropic viruses. And HIV strains that bind the CCR5 chemokine co-receptor, meaning they bind macrophages, can be called R5 tropic viruses. This is important because co-receptor usage functions in viral tropism, viral transmission, and d disease progression. So just a little bit about GP, the GP120 structure. Here's a one-dimensional topological view of the protein. It's 500 amino acids long. There's a constant core region, and on the surface, it has five variable loops, variable in terms of amino acid sequence. There are four crystal structures solved of GP120. You can see two here. Here's um, the GP120 core protein here also, and it's bound in CD, with CD4, and also it was solved in complex with an antibody. The antibody, where the antibody is bound to GP120 is where GP120 would normally be bound to the chemokine co-receptors. So this is the co-receptor binding interface on both these two. So as I talked about, there are these variable loops on the surface of this GP120 protein, and one of these loops is in particular importance. It's called the V3 loop. So what's already known about this? Well, the V3 loop interacts directly with chemokine, the chemokine co-receptors, and HIV infectivity is destroyed if the V3 loop is deleted. So, and it was previously shown that specific residues on the V3 loop dictate the uh, co-receptor usage. So you can uh, distinguish this rule that a positively charged amino acid on the V3 loop at certain positions, either 11, 24, 25, which can be found here on the V3 loop, indicate that this HIV strand is an X4 tropic virus. Otherwise, it's an R5 tropic virus. So structurally, what does this mean? It means that there's a single electrostatic protein surface patch that binds the receptor. So what this is saying is that there's a positively charged patch on GP120 that binds the CXCR4 co-receptor, and it, there's a negatively charged patch that binds the CCR5 co-receptor. But not all HIV sequences fit this rule, meaning we can't just look to these three amino acid positions to define um, the tropism of a particular HIV strain. So what 
This study hoped to do was to look at positions outside of the V3 loop on the rest of the GP120 core to see if there were any other amino acid positions that were significant in functioning in um, determining co-receptor usage. So what did we do? Well, first, you have obtained the sets of data, and you have sequences from X4 tropic viruses and sequences from R5 tropic viruses. So we had 238 R5 tropic strains and 35 um, X4 tropic strains, and these were unique whole GP120 sequences, um, one from each HIV patient. So when you have these sequences, what do you do? So again, we're trying to define, find positions outside on GP120 that um, are different, or that can have some indication of co-receptor usage that between um, the X4 tropic viral strains and the R5 tropic viral strains. So the first thing we did was we made two sequence alignments between the X4 tropic set and the R5 tropic set. But the problem is, how do you compare a specific position between this set and this set? Well, as I said, we have two structures available, each from um, each type of virus. So what we can do is, to compare an amino acid at the same position in both these structures, we can superimpose these structures and find positions that overlap. So each of these structures has a sequence which is also aligned with this big sequence. So for example, this position 440, which aligns in these super impositioned structures, aligns right here. So we can say, okay, well this position in this sequence right here is maybe in this column right here. And this position aligns in the R5 tropic sequences, so we can find where it is in here. So this way, we just have a way of comparing um, amino acid positions so we can find if there is any kind of difference. So what do you do with this information? Well, you do a statistical analysis. We use the chi-squared test, and we use p-values to determine if there are any significant amino acid charge differences with these. So to do this, we used a charge scale because, as I said before, with the V3 loop, charge played an important role in determining co-receptor usage. So we just did a simple scale. It was positive one for lysines and arginines, which are positively charged amino acids, negative one for aspartic acid and glutamic acids, which are neg negatively charged, and neutral, um, zero for all the other neutral amino acids. So with this charge scale, again, we can do this statistical analysis, this chi-squared test to compare um, and calculate the difference between the positions. So from this, we can get a p-value. The smaller the p-value means the difference we see between these two sets of data is significant, and it's not due to random chance. So the results we got when we plot the position on GP120 on the bottom and the negative log p-value. So the higher the negative log p-value, the um, more significance the difference in amino acid charge between these two sets of data at this particular position is. So we found seven positions that showed high um, charge difference between the X4 and the R5 tropic sets. So here's just a summary slide. I know it's a lot of data here, but um, it's just showing the position on the GP120 core of the amino acids, um, their number that we found have the highest significant charge difference and their negative log p-value. So I just plotted these positions. I don't know if you can see that well. So again, here's the GP120 structure. Here's the CD4 receptor that it was solved in complex with, and here's the antibody. So this is the face that GP120 binds the chemokine co-receptors. This is the V3 loop on GP120, and here's position, position 11 and 25, which I told you are important to chemokine co-receptor binding. So the positions we found as statistically significant are indicated right here. So the two that we found that had the highest significance, which means that um, based on amino acid charge, these positions showed that there was a great charge difference between the X4 virus strains and the R5 virus strains. And what's important to notice here is that 
both these um, amino acid positions fall right outside the V3 loop. So what I was talking about before is when the V3 loop binds the chemokine co-receptor, it forms a sort of an interface. So we think that we identified these residues, so the interface can include these residues now. So it's pretty significant finding. So just conclusions, um, we found seven significant positions on the GP120 core surface based on charge difference. So we had one position uh, which faced the CD4 binding site. There were four others that were closer to the viral membrane contact site. So we're not sure um, how significant these positions are in the co-receptor usage determination. They might have some indirect effect. And we have these two positions that we found that face the proposed co-receptor binding site, and they have very high negative log p values. And this position 373 has never been indicated in any research to be of, of significance in this study. So this is a very like key and new finding. So I guess that's about it. <laughs> so. So, well, so what we're trying to do is identify the chemokine um, binding surface on GP120 because that's not known, so how it interacts. So this can, these positions can help us uh, identify that interface. So not just on V3 loop, but on GP120. So basically this can lead to d drug targeting and vaccine design later. So. <laughs> Okay, thank you.